stupid saxy humans. These three words were muttered by every race the humans encountered. Well, to be specific, every race from the Draco section of the galaxy. I think you all know where this lesson is going in class, said the Talakton teacher, sighing as his three eyes darted around the classroom, looking around at his 18 students. This was the moment they had all been waiting for. The Kurz War. The students were obviously excited to hear about this, their eyes darting toward the teacher. Humans are a rather interesting race, began the teacher, when the Galactic Council first noticed them. They welcomed them into the council, or for the humans to flat out refuse, and said, quote, We turned down this offer, as we do not want to be shackled by the will of people, not of our own race, though we are willing to make an alliance. The council found this strange, but didn't care much and formed an alliance. The council soon found out why the humans wouldn't join. Humans have always been a rebellious race. They hate being told what to do. The council had a list of rules that all members must follow. Two of these rules were ones that humans could simply not agree with. One was the rule that stated interspecies relationships were not allowed. This rule was put in place for, I have to admit, a dumb reason. The reason was the counselors didn't like to have romantic relations with a member of another race because, as they called it, it would contaminate the blood of their race. The other rule the humans didn't like was the one that stated that each species has to send what is essentially tribute to the council so they can fund any exploration efforts they send into the galaxy. The teacher darted his eyes around the class once again before continuing. You may wonder where Dracos falls in this. Dracos was an independent sector of the galaxy, ruled by the Dracos Empire. The dominant race were a reptilian-like race comprised of several different species of Snarconics or Lamias, as the humans call them, Lizanox or lizard folk, as humans calls them, which is a slur, so don't call them by that. And finally, Renes, which were an amphibian-like race. Now, the Dracos Empire had a warrior-like society and was deeply religious following the god Quasimotle, which was described as a massive turtle that kept the universe at a constant balance. The teacher briefly turns on the hollow projector to show the class where the Dracos sector is. Now, as we all know, 60 years ago, the humans humiliated the Dracos in the War of Helmet Liberation. The war was a massive and bloody one and ended in a human victory. After that, they went on to gain the planet of Kurtz, which had lots of a rather useless substance, by galactic standards, called oil. Humans rely on this substance to fuel their terraforming machines, which they use to terraform mostly barren planets. The population of the planet mostly consisted of snarconics, and the human occupation force got extremely bored as they had nothing to do. The teacher was then cut off by one of his students. Is this where we get to the whole... The teacher then cut off the student. Yes, the teacher sighs in annoyance. Human soldiers have a tendency to whatever they want to entertain themselves when they are bored, and it is a reacquiring theme. In most wars, they have fought in their history. Most of the times when humans mate, they simply do it for pleasure not to have offspring, though that does happen eventually. To most species, this idea is considered a sign of lack of intelligence, as most species see mating as something you do to have offspring not for pleasure. So, as you can guess, the bored human soldiers rapidly began to attempt to mate with female snarconics. Now, it really didn't help that the humans, to put it lightly, didn't give a damn about religious customs. Before a snarconic mate, it is seen as essential that they take a ceremonial bath. Humans didn't care about customs. Now you have to hand it to the humans. They had charisma since they mated with a large portion of the female population. Humans were seen as an attractive race in the galaxy, and that seems to have got them a long way. Now the humans also went on to violate several other key religious laws that were followed by the snarconics that included humans introducing their own frankly ridiculous religious beliefs. One of their most famous religious figures is a naked man on a cross. The students snicker and laugh at this. The constant violations of religious customs, laws, and probably the jealousy of the male snarconics created a boiling pot for anger, fear, and hatred that was destined to burst into a rebellion. Yet this whole war would be started in the dumbest way possible. The bell then rings, signaling that class is over, and the students rush out to lunch talking and chatting. The teacher looks on and reviews his lesson formatting before awaiting the end of lunch, so a new group of students would arrive, and he would have to discuss this all over again. School of Diplomacy, Intergalactic Relations, and History. Sin firing. 2334. I scrolled through my data pad and found what I had been looking for. The reason the Kurz War had started. I had been given the daunting task of gathering information on this for my assignment. Most human sources were biased, or straight-up propaganda. Draco's sources were arguably the worst, with most of them, focusing on solely the religious aspects of the war and flat-out ignoring all their military defeats. Most of my sources had been interviews with soldiers of both sides of the war, 
and looking over the still fresh battle sites on the planet, I had luckily just found a human work of literature titled From Sex to War. The book was made by one of the half-humans, Edward Yonseth. I began to scroll through it, taking note of the frankly ridiculous reasons for the war, until I found the part that talked about what was the final boiling point that started the war. To say the least, I was not impressed and rather amused. To quote from this historical literature, Priest Yasamon had been attending his duties as the local priest of the shell. Shells, if you're wondering where massive turtle shell-shaped churches where the Snarconics would go to worship their turtle god Atu. It is believed in their religion that this turtle keeps the galaxy in balance. After attending his duties, he began to slither up to the tree he came from. For context, most small Snarconic and Dracos communities were built around the abnormal large trees that grew on the planet Kurtz. The Snarconics built what can be seen as large tree houses that were the size of around a mason. This was due to the fact your average female Snarconic after mating would lay five eggs. To the priest's utter horror when he arrived, he found his wife mating with a human soldier. The priest calmed himself, walked up to them, and asked if they had taken the ritual bath. The naked and scared human soldier responded in a confusion about how a ritual bath mattered in this. This was his undoing, as if you find your partner cheating on you and she or the man she is with hasn't taken the ritual bath. You have the right to kill them, as stated by religious law. Having to proper means to justify what he did, the priest threw the soldier off the tree and towards his death, and then stabbed his wife repeatedly, killing her. Now, the largest mistake the priest made was seeing who was friends with the soldier. The human had been friends with many humans, who were part of a subgroup called Americans. Americans are many things, but if there's one thing, they love its violence. Once the soldier's friends found out about what happened to their friend and who killed him, they boarded a tank the following day and rolled it up to the local shell, demanding the other priest to hand Yasaman over, or they would blow the shell sky high. The other priest, terrified, handed him over, which had earned them an immediate beating by the growing mob of confused and angry snarconic civilians who saw what the other priest did as cowardice. The human soldiers watching this let go of Yasamon and rolled back their tank as they saw the ever-growing crowd and even armed, angry snarconics. This was a mistake, as Yasamon ordered the angry crowd to attack, in his words, human heretics. The crowd swarmed the human tank, forcing the crew to be locked inside. Had it not been for arriving human UN troops, the tank crew would have been pulled out of the tank and beheaded. This incident, labeled the Yasamon Affair, gave the humans an excuse to send an extra two million soldiers to Kurtz. This action triggered mass riots and led to small insurgent groups popping up. In 2307, a snarconic insurgent attack was launched on the human embassy, killing five human soldiers and three ambassadors. This is considered the beginning of the Kurtz War, but everyone agrees that the soldier thrown out of the tree was the first casualty of the war. I decided to take a brief break from the mess I had just read, though. I went on to read an article on the main reasons the insurgencies popped up. The article said, During the interview between the Dracos Press and one of the key leaders in the Snarconic insurgency, the leader said that the main reason for this war was the lack of human respect, not taking ritual baths, and the hypnotizing of their women through sexual means. The last part got me. They had gone to war against the humans, not because the humans were occupying the planet. No, it had been because the humans had been stealing their women. I found this quite frankly hilarious. As stupid as this was, the Dracos Empire, who had been still quite bitter about getting humiliated by the humans. During the Dracos, apparently they thought it was a good idea to land a tank on the massive Kazmuth Glacier Station and take photos of it and send it to the human government. Based on the military records, I found this glacier had no strategic value. Most likely that this action was some kind of flex, and if they wanted to get a reaction, they succeeded. Since the next day, the humans declared war on the Dracos Empire. The human president swore to get back the glacier. I find this quite stupid and hilarious. The tank on the glacier and all the Dracos soldiers on the glacier were stranded on glacier the minute human air superiority showed itself. As expected, the insurgency allies itself with the Dracos Empire. I sometimes wonder why wars like this happen, but I guess we'll never know. 2108, Kazmuth Glacier, Kurds. Okay, move up, scale the glacier, yelled an officer. I looked up at the imposing height of the glacier. He readied his ice axe and put on his climbing boots. This was it, they would scale the glacier and surprise the Dracos. This would teach them. He and his comrades would begin scaling the glacier, plasma grenades and knives ready. They couldn't bring their guns because it would be too heavy for the climb. Scaling a glacier was as hard as expected. This was a stealth mission after all. 
Let's hope the new invisibility armor they were issued with would work. He almost fell off a couple times but reached the top along with his comrades. The top of the glacier seemed empty. Fan out. Search the perimeter, barked the officer. Nothing. Just an empty glacier. No tank, no Dracos, just an empty glacier. Seems the bastards pull out. Fuck ya. They got scared and ran, said a soldier. The officer then broke discipline. Wanna just head back down and back to the city and get drinks, he spoke. Fuck ya, said the others. We began to rappel down the glacier. When we reached the bottom, my unit went into town. I thought it was rather strange how the Draco stationed soldiers on that glacier, only to withdraw them when they, I guess, found out we were going to try to retake the glacier. What a bunch of cowards. Journal of Henrik William. He was killed the next day in the Battle of Nargoth. Nargoth, 2108. Kurds. I sat watching the priest's sermon. The turtle shall keep this world in balance. The heretics will be damned. There is no greater sin than to steal a man's birthright and shackle him to watch as his wife gets raped. He yelled to the crowd, The Dracos drafted our young men and sent them to die against the human oppressors. They promised us freedom, and when they lost, pinned the blame on us and sold our planet to the humans. No more. Our son's lonely graves are at Agathon and Brainus. No more. We choose our deaths this time. It is better to die on one's feet than to live on one's knees. He continued to speak with a passion and hatred unmatched. We will get our retribution. We will hang the humans. No quarter will be given. Take up arms, my sons, and do what God commands you to do. We gathered and grabbed our las rifles and whatever we could find. We may have outdated weapons, but it won't stop us. This was it. Nargoth was our capital. If we took it, our revolt would spread and we would earn our hard-won freedom. Our first target was the human's armory. There was one guard. We rushed him. If there is one good thing I'll ever say about humans, it is bravery. He fired his assault rifle like a madman and killed two of us before we overpowered him and stabbed him to death. I stole his gun off his dead body. I'll never understand why humans use bullets. Lasers are better. We got to the armory and found a plethora of human guns, explosives, and more. Soon we had secured most of the city. The bartenders gave all their bottles so we could make what humans call a Molotov cocktail. Building barricades was hard labor, but it would be worth it when we sent the expected human counterattack to its doom. We might have hated Dracos, but the humans were worse. The Dracos Empire had told us that they would distract the humans long enough by stationing a tank in the Kazmuth Glacier and sending us proper laser rifles and air support. Me and the lads hoped they would keep to their promise. Nargoth 2108, Kurds. I walked along the streets of Nargoth one Easter morning. I noticed I saw that instead of UN flags, Kurds flags waved at the top of the many tree houses and buildings in the city. I had come one vacation to Kurds due to it being labeled a good vacation spot. Never would I think I would see such a sight in my life. There were lines of armed snarconics marching through the streets. It was a sight to see. No pipes did hum. No battle drums I heard this foggy morning. But the bell on top of the tallest tree, which seemed to be larger than America's Statue of Liberty, rang out in Nargoth. A snarconic who I assumed was a priest talked about how it was better to die beneath a snarconic sky than to continue living under oppression. I'm surprised I wasn't killed on the spot for being a human, probably because their religious law goes against killing civilians. I couldn't help but admire this show of bravery. This place will be a war zone soon. Knowing how we act, this will get messy. I could run away from this place. But something in me wants to say, maybe I can make friends with these brave people. I hope I can journal of the human John Preston. Kypri Forest, Kurs, 2108, my dearest mother and dad, I'm writing this before the most important day of my life. Soon enough, I'll be off doing my bit for humanity. Tomorrow morning, I shall take my men to Nargoth to assist our lads in stopping the humans. I have come to love my men and who I think love me back. I'm sure you'll be happy to hear my men shall be the first to enter the city. I took my communion with the lads yesterday. I'm certain I shall make it through safely. But if it's the turtle's holy will that I must join him in paradise, I'm quite prepared to go. I wish I had more time to write, but time presses. I dearly love now. Au revoir, as the humans from France say. Fondest love to all those I love dearly. Your devoted and happy son, Arnar. Second lit Arnar of the Snarconic Liberation Army in a letter to his parents. Club Iris, Kurz, 2105. A delegation of snarconics walks into a secret room in the club. Human soldiers are too drunk, and sex crazed to notice five Dracos and one human enter the room as well. Two are well-known Dracos nationalists who have funded rebellions in human territory. One is a diplomat from Dracos, and one is a former spy. The human in the party is Chief Ambassador Robert Howard. Howard was a devoted Chrisalm. Chrisalm was a blend between Christianity and Islam, which had sprung up after humanity had united in 2075 to defeat the Dracos Empire. 
Howard had been secretly smuggling out Draco soldiers out of human prisons and back to Kurtz to assist in the upcoming rebellion. The Snarconic delegation was made up of six male and one female Snarconic. The two parties begin their discussion. The Snarconics demand only two things, guns and ammo. The Draco's delegation agreed to provide them with such guns and ammo. The date for the rebellion was chosen. It would be launched in the holiday humans called Easter, as most human soldiers would be drinking and celebrating to properly act when the rebellion happened. University of History and Diplomacy, Galactic Confederation, 2134. The professor began his lesson on the Kurtz War. He was in Nexton, Nextons, where a race that could change their shape and size at will and had been nearly wiped out by the humans just nine years earlier in the Nexton genocide. Today, we are taking a step back to discuss the backroom deals and operators trying to arm the preparations in the Kurtz War. He began. By the end of 2105, preparations for a snarconic uprising were underway, but its planners turned it into a messy web of secrets, lies, and arguing. The plotters were only a segment of the snarconic nationalist movement and had lied their way into gaining guns and ammo from the Draco's empire. This segment, no, as the snarconic brotherhood was a religious extremist faction, which was a mess on its own since half of its members had converted to human religions, while the other half stick to old tradition values and worshiping the turtle. To further confuse things was the fact that many of the humans on the edge of the Draco's border were adventure seekers who had no issues on turning on their own kind if it meant glory and fame. Just five years prior, a group of these adventure seekers rebelled against the human government, hoping to gain attentions and fame by playing the victim. Many of these heroes sarcastically joined the Snarconics, but also saw a chance to mate with their women. The professor pauses and then continues. The only human who was actually truly invested into the cause was Robert Howard, the human chief ambassador of the humans at the time. W. Hi, he became obsessed with the Snarconic cause is relatively unknown. I, several human sources, point him out as the John Brown of space, while Draco's sources refuse to acknowledge he was even a key part in the rebellion, and others say he was married to a Snarconic and felt sympathy for them because of his marriage. He turns on a protector showing a human with a beard and glasses wearing a black suit and tie. Then a label appears above the protection that confirms that the human in the projection is Howard. Howard would attempt to smuggle prisoners from the Draco's War. He only smuggled around 200 out of human prisons. Heavy security wasn't the reason he failed to smuggle large amounts of prisoners out of human territory. The reason was many of the prisoners simply saw the writing on the wall. If they were smuggled out and this rebellion failed, they would most certainly have faced the firing squad, and many were about to be released anyways and saw escaping as pointless. This was not the only ill omen of disaster. The Draco's empire supplied them less guns and ammo than expected, and the Draco's army that was supposed to be deployed to assist the rebellion was in poor shape. The Draco's army and fleet were still recovering from its defeat in the Draco's human war, and the Draco's economy had also crashed due to hyperinflation caused by the previous war. The professor then shows a graph that shows a mess of different snarconic organizations and their leaders. Many of us clowned on the humans and the fact that this whole rebellion was fueled by the humans mating with the snarconic women and them not taking ritual baths, but I.D. like to point out the so-called heroes, were little better. Most narconics simply wanted to organize riots and protest and believe that a rebellion should happen much later and wait for the Galactic Council would inviably force the humans off their planet. Then the more radical groups had even more radical groups in them. Assassinations of leaders would happen at random, and in one case, human soldiers walked in on a snarconic civilians suffocating a radical who had bragged about suicide bombing the local armor with a pillow. To make things even more confusing, half of the Snarconic Brotherhood, which were tasked with panning the rebellion, had no idea of this planned uprising. Why at did they not know? Well, to put it simply, religion. The most of the Snarconics who had converted to human religion hadn't been told because they were seen as lesser beings and semi-traitors because of the fact they believed in human religion. To add even more confusion, there was a group in the Brotherhood called the Righteous Fists of Justice, who followed a politician belief humans call communism. A second organization called the People's Army was made up of all the other races that lived on Kurtz, excluding the humans. The professor then showed a projection of a human military council. Ironically enough, the humans knew all about this rebellion and the infighting inside the snarconic organizations. They had in secret in 2106, had kidnapped Howard, after finding out he was in on the plot, 
and several snarconics who believed the rebellion would end in disaster had leaked the whole plan to the human military. Now what happened next is heavily debated. The humans really did nothing with the info and didn't try to stop the rebellion. There are two opposing arguments about their decision to ignore the info. One was that they wanted the rebellion to happen so they could have an excuse to go to war with the Draco's empire again and steal more resources from them. Or two, they simply thought it wasn't a possibility and this was a hoax. Either one is likely. Now write a nine page essay on which of these two opinions you believe and have it done by tomorrow, says the professor. The students leave and head to their dorms or homes as another day in collage ends. Nargoth occurs April the 22nd, Easter Sunday, 2108. Civilians look from their windows, tree houses, and burrows as thousands upon thousands of marching snarconics armed with plasma rifles, human guns, and wearing green uniforms and civilian clothes. Green armbands proclaim them to be nationalist paramilitary insurgents. Marching with them are their leaders, Priest Kusining and Kolaren Narmak, the leader of the communist faction. The first building to fall is the Grand Shell, which is the largest shell in the city and is the size of a large human cinema, slithering onto the roof of the shell. Kusining proclaims, my brothers and sons, an armed uprising against the human heretics is underway. No more will be shackled by their religious ignorance and oppression. I proclaim the independence of a free and prosperous Snoronic Caliphate. Now is the time that will decide the future of the galaxy and our survival. I call on you, my sons and daughters, to join me. To his utter surprise, none heeded his call of revolution. You fool, you'll bring ruin to the Snarconic race, yell a Snarconic woman from the crowd. I have a human boyfriend, get your religious bullshit out of here, yelled another. Things rapidly got out of hand when priest Snarok, the head priest of the Grand Shell, stood up and yelled, kill these traitors, they'll bring ruin to us. Angry civilians, fearful of what the humans might do to follow his order and attempted to attack the insurgents and almost lynched Kusining had it not been for his men firing on the crowd, killing 34 snarconics. The first casualties of the uprising weren't caused by humans fighting snarconics, but tragically snarconic on snarconic violence. Students of Balafat Religious College armed themselves and got into a fierce gun battle with the rebels and attempted to contact the human space fleet for fire support. To further add insult to injury, the factory workers of Garnesh Tank Factory, which supplied tanks to the humans, used the very tanks they made to run over rebels and make a breakout to escape the city. To make things worse, petty rivalries between the various factions lead to friendly fire, or cases where rebel factions that were supposed to come to aid in the fighting flat out refused to take up arms. The rebel leaders had expected around 6 million rebel volunteers to arrive to assist in securing the capital, Nargoth, but only 100,000 of these showed up. However, progress was still strong somehow in this mess of an uprising. The tank factory had been captured after its work rode away, with most of the tanks along with the tallest tree in the city, the human embassy, and Green Square, which was a square made up of several burrows that the Snarconics lived in, along with human apartment buildings. Outside the city, a group of 500 volunteers who had been heading to assist in the rising attempt to take the human armory outside the city. They killed the one guard guarding it and made off with a plethora of human guns and ammo and decided to head to attack the nearby town instead of assisting the uprising in the city. The human guard, Henrik William, was the first human to be killed in the uprising. Back inside the city, the rebels began to turn houses, buildings, trees, and burrows into strong points and set up barricades, food and ammunition depots, and set up medical centers for the wounded. To try to stop the humans' advantage in air power and the human space fleet, the rebels attempted to destroy the airfield and airport inside the city. They also successfully bombed the landing docks, preventing any human ships from landing inside the city properly. While the rebels were being proactive, the humans' cluelessness Nargoth, Dragon Street, April 24th, 2108. I saw our other five transport vehicles move along the city's main road. Some gunshots had been heard deep inside the city, and my platoon was sent in to investigate. Our commander had told us it had been a minor snarconic riot and that this should be an easy job. I then heard a loud bang. One of the transport Humvees behind us had exploded into flames, and plasma ripped through the air. I scrambled out of the vehicle, and within a second, six of the members of my platoon lay dead. Follow me, lads, this way into the building, yelled our captain. His head was then disintegrated by a plasma bolt. Over the radio, I heard what must have been snarconic insurgents insulting us. They somehow got a hold of our comms and were saying how after we all died, they would mate with our girlfriends. If they wanted to rile us up, they did. One of my squad mates leaped out and fired widely into the surrounding buildings and trees, 
I saw a snarconic nurse who was returning from work get shredded to bits by his wild shooting. He was then killed by a sniper's bullet. I somehow in the chaos slipped into an alleyway and ran to an empty burrow and hid in it. Thank God I survived, I told myself. Nargoth, curse, 2108. The human command was paralyzed with indecision. Most of the human command in the city had 600,000 soldiers at their disposal and far outnumbered the rebels. But their commander told them to stay in their barracks until orders directly from the human government arrived. Only one small company had been dispatched to quell the uprising, and it had been annihilated in an ambush that killed 45 of its 56 men. Ironically enough, the sharpest fighting on the first four days of the uprising were the snarconic rebels attempting to storm the religious collage mentioned earlier. The students of the collage fought every assault, and the rebels stopped after losing 500 men in the battle. The students had it the worst, with 3,400 of its 4,900 students being killed in the defense. On the fifth day, a human battalion in the city entered the Red Hotel. The Red Hotel was a massive tree that housed several burrows and tunnels in the tree itself and had several tree houses on its massive branches. The hotel got its name from the colors of the bark of the tree. The human soldiers ushered out the guests and positioned sharpshooters and machine gun teams in windows. Soon, six more human battalions enter into the hotel to fortify it even further. Nargoth, Red Hotel, April 27, 2108. I took careful aim with my sniper rifle. I could see the insurgents down in the green square that laid in front of the hotel. I take aim and fire. I pop the head of one of the insurgents and they duck for cover. Our machine gun team, which I had assumed was a floor below me, opens up on them and mows several down. It turns into a brutal firefight, but one by one, the insurgents fall. So far, not one of our guys have died or been wounded. Then I heard a loud boom. It was our artillery. Artillery shells fell on the square and turned and knocked down the trees and turned the buildings to rubble. I heard that the leader of the communist branch of the insurgents say, humans are capitalist. They would never destroy private property and infrastructure. It seems we proved him wrong. To my horror, though, several civilians who had been going about their normal lives were simply erased from existence as our artillery shells rained down on the square. Then I heard our sergeant yell, The barrage is over! Head to the bottom of the hotel! We are taking the square! I rushed down. I saw around 600 of my comrades around me. Our sergeant took out his whistle and blew it. We rushed out and dashed for the ruined buildings and burrows in the square. I saw men go down left and right. It seemed some of the insurgents had survived the barrage. I saw some dash out from their cover and towards our dead to loot them. I gunned them down and killed about nine of them. I ran, ran into a ruined apartment building and found my way into a good room to use as a sniper's nest. I once again positioned myself and took aim and looked for any insurgents who dared pop their heads out. Nargoth Kurds, April the 29th, May 27, the 2108. By the 29th of April, the humans inside the city began to strike out and strike at rebel positions. Human tactics consisted of either isolating small pockets of rebels, holding out in buildings, or blowing up trees and anything the rebels might use for cover. This came at the cost of civilian lives. Green Square, which saw a battalion of humans attempt to force the insurgents out, was one of many rebels' strongholds in the city. The battle for the square only got bloodier. In the following 36 hours, the square changed hands a total of 27 times. And on the 28th, this attempt, the humans succeeded in having a firm hold on it. The battle for Green Square left 1,450 humans dead and also killed 12,000 rebels. The battle for the city's tallest tree was no different. The defenders held out for 56 hours before human tanks rolled in and fired the tree, causing it to collapse. Humans repeatedly deployed tear gas to clear our rebels in the building, and in one case, used mustard gas to try to take destroyed landing docks from snarconic rebel hands. Now in this brutal fighting, facts are hard to find. Human soldiers claim that rebel fighters used snarconic women as human shields and that they were pretending to be civilians to get the upper hand in fighting. Now, this may have been true, or it may have been a justification for what happens next. On May 1st, one of the battalions of human soldiers, angry about the losses sustained in securing Green Square, burst into snarconic humans and proceeded to kill all men above the ages of 15 and kidnapped and possibly raped all women above the age of 18. The human government still denies that this happened to this very day. This became known as the Rape of Green Square. A total of 150 snarconic males were killed, and the number of rape victims remains unknown. For the rebels, the Rape of Green Square was an example of human lust and brutality. For the humans, it was the inevitable result when you blur the line between soldier and civilian purposely. Strangely and ironically enough, 
Many of the Snarconic civilians shared the human view. This may have been because they weren't present at the rape itself, or because they were afraid of what the humans would do to them if they spoke against them. The bloodiest engagement of the battle for Nargoth happened on May 13th in the city's botanical garden. A division of 17,000 humans had been making its way through the garden towards the Grand Shell to try to capture it. Captain Darris Oxford briefly breaks ranks to greet a snarconic woman, her two children. They are his wife and two daughters. Even though large sections of the city are destroyed, he is relieved to see they are safe and sound, and they, for their part, will never see him again. Just an hour later, as they are nearing the Grand Shell, the rebels ambush the division and rip it to shreds. Darris is one of the first to fall. The humans, in their stupidity and bravery, pressed on and stormed buildings, resulting in heavy melee fighting. The Snarconics' fangs were venomous, and several human soldiers were bitten and died from the venom during the melee. In one case, several human soldiers fled across a bridge in the tree canopy, only for the rebels to blow it up, sending their human soldier falling to their deaths. The human push on the Grand Shell is halted. The result is 12,000 humans are killed, the greatest single loss of life in the war. In the south of the city, heavy fighting ensued in the city sewers, with human soldiers blowing holes in the sewer walls to surprise rebels on the other side. The rebels fought for every inch, believing they were on the side of the turtle. In one case, when one rebel officer was wounded, he ordered his men to leave him behind and continued to fight on only with a revolver he had stolen off a dead human until he was bayoneted to death. The human space fleet and reinforcements arrived on the 19th. Soon, human ships orbitally bombarded the city, killing rebels and civilians alike. On the 21st of May, the news that the Dracos Empire had made peace with the humans shattered all hopes of success. After the Dracos space fleet had been defeated at the Battle of Hardra, four, the Dracos Empire sued for peace. The rebels were now truly on their own. On the 23rd, the Grand Shell is bombarded into submission, and it catches fire, forcing the leader of the revolt to retreat into the Dracos embassy in the city. On the 24th of the next day, Priest Kusining, the leader of the revolt, sends a message to the human generals asking for terms. The Snarconic Rising is over. Kunsining is taken into captivity the next day. While Kunsining and most of the rebels had surrendered the communist factions held out in the city's sewers for another two days before surrendering on the 27th, the cost of the uprising soon became clear. 26,000 human soldiers were killed and 43,000 wounded. The rebels lost 66,000 dead and 23,000 wounded. The greatest cost was the one the civilians suffered. 160,000 civilians were killed in the months-long fighting. The city had been turned to ash as many of the trees that had once been used as homes had burned down and human-made buildings had become rubble. Guantanamo Bay, Earth, February 1st, 2109. Consining writes letters to his family members as he sits in his cell. Then four human soldiers enter and drag him out toward the beach. He is tied to a pole, gagged and blindfolded. The execution squad lines up 12 feet away. They aim their rifles and fire from 2108 onwards. In the aftermath of the battle for Nargoth, thousands of rebels were paraded by the humans in front of angry crowds. Many snarconic civilians insulted the rebel prisoners, calling them murders for the destruction they brought to the city. Humans tried 17,000 of these rebels in private courts where they weren't given basic rights and 1,500 were sentenced to death. Another 3,000, including Kunsing, were sent to Guantanamo Bay to await an execution, and the rest were sent to re-education camps across human-controlled space. This revolt marked the last major revolt in Snarconic history, and in 2123, after several peaceful protests and a change in the human government, they were granted independence. The revolt in many ways was seen as pointless and dumb. Human actions in the revolt further this statement as humans made several mistakes and acted ignorantly throughout most of it. While the galaxy ridicules the rebellion, the Snarconics see it in a different light. To the Sarconics, this was either a war of independence that was fought by brave men in the name of religion and race, while others see it as a group of armed radicals, taking things too far, Aang bringing wrath and ruin to the capital. As in most wars, this war is a gray zone, with it being hard to say who is right and wrong. But perhaps the bloodshed of the uprising can be seen in one incident. On May 3rd, as fighting raged on in the Nargoth, a soldier opened fire on three civilians, killing them. The soldier claimed that what he did was to root out snarconic rebels, who may have been pretending to be civilians. Many snarconics claimed the soldier was human, but he wasn't. The soldier was a snarconic who had executed the three civilians to root out members of a rival insurgent group. Such incidents show us what can happen in war and revolutions, and how it's not all black and white.
In war, there are no bad guys, and the civilians pay the greatest price in times of war and rebellion. 